Welcome to the chase. The Chiefs is a white arc podcast aimed at specifically giving you an insight into what makes great leaders and entrepreneurs in a variety of organizations tick. We call them Chiefs. My name is James Chuffatelli, and together with my White Arc co-chief, Joe Hands, we're going to attempt to take you on a journey and talk to as many chiefs across as many industries as we can to give you an insight into A, what makes them tick, and B, what makes their enterprises thrive, and more importantly, what they've learned along the way. The Chiefs. Welcome to The Chiefs, a White Arc podcast specifically aimed at giving you an insight into what makes great leaders tick. So today I'm very, very excited to be joined by David Thody. So a big personal highlight for me, I was at Telstra when David was the CEO and he took the organisation on a journey around culture change and really around the customer and how the customer needed to be the centre of everything we thought about at Telstra and David did an unbelievable job at taking people on that journey and I was quite new to the organization at the time and was very much in awe of of the way he did that and the way that he went about it. So I'm very honored today to have David on the podcast of the Chiefs. So David Sodi is the chair of the Commonwealth Society Industry and Research Organization, Zero Tyro Payments and is also the director of Ramsey Healthcare. Many people know, however, David Thody as the CEO of Telstra in his time and has had many senior executive roles in a range of different companies. So previously, he was the executive director and CEO of Telstra, appointed in May, and he retired his position on the 30th of April 2015. Before joining Telstra, David was CEO of IBM and during his 22 years at IBM, holds many senior executive positions. So what an absolutely unbelievable experience that David brings. So today is all about you, David. A lot of people will never get to meet you, never get to have a conversation with you. So today is to find out a bit more about you, your journey, the lessons you learned along the way, and how other people who are also doing their leadership journey can learn from you. So we'll get the ball rolling. So, David, what is your personal theme for 2021? Well, firstly, Joe, thanks for having me on this podcast for me. It's my pleasure. And you make me sound really old. <laughs> 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 which, um, which I don't, actually, I don't feel old at all. I mean, I really enjoy life. <laughs> yeah, interesting question to k- kick off with. You know, what's my personal theme this year? Look, it, it's really hard to go past COVID and, and getting back to a normality, whatever that new normal will be. It's been a a pretty amazing 15 months, hasn't it, for all of yeah. us and and personally, but in work, the whole economy. And even today, as we're doing this podcast, I see Brisbane's going into lockdown for, you know, two or three days. So, yeah, I think that's really what I, I'm reflecting on here. How do we individually sort of get back to whatever this new normal is? How do we get the organisations we're working with, our lives, our families, back to that? And, of course, Yesterday, our job keeper stopped, so we've got a million people who are getting supported now transitioning into a new world. So that's my personal theme at the moment. So that's uh, preoccupying my thinking quite a bit. Yeah, and it's completely fair enough, right? It was like when it first happened, like this time last year, we were all in kind of survival mode, right? And yeah. now we're into how do we get back into some level of normalcy, whatever that is. And yeah. what does that mean for our personal lives, our professional lives, the businesses yeah. we're running? And everyone yeah. is navigating a new normal, but also something that they've never navigated before. So it's yeah. kind yeah. of dealing with uncertainty, which I think a lot of people are struggling with. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And ambiguity, it isn't that apparent what the answer is all the time. And we're trying to navigate our way through there. And I think that's a really important observation, Joe. We just can't get absolute clarity. And so we've got to sort of be a bit gray around the edges, but keep moving forward and correcting as we go. I mean, even the vaccine or how we handle this virus, I mean, at CSRO, we've done a lot of work in that area, but we're still discovering things all the time about how it behaves. These vaccines, yes, we've rushed them. Isn't it great what they've done? It's not 100% about everything. So 
but we've got to work within those uh, guardrails and even coming back to work, which we might talk about later on. Mm. Uh, how do we do that in a way that's going to appreciate individuals' concerns and the new reality they live with, but also getting on with work. So it yeah. is a balancing act. Yeah, it's interesting one. I always reflect on talking to the clients and the companies that I'm working with that this is kind of, we're at a fork in the road, right? And this is going to mm. define some organisations yeah. for the better. Yeah. It's going to define some people's leadership, hopefully, for the better. But to your point, it's people have got to lean in, right? With the yeah. ambiguity, they've got to go, I'm okay with the ambiguity and I've got to make a decision and we've got to keep moving forward because yeah. there is a lot of opportunity in the market off the back of it. There's a lot of industry mm. companies that have been significantly impacted, but there's a lot of opportunity for companies that are willing to kind of take it, do something a bit different or think outside the yeah. market a little bit differently. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So you've had a real range of a leadership journey to date, right? You've still got a significant one to go. But Thank, well, thanks for saying that, Joe. <laughs> I, that makes me feel better. Because <laughs> like, you said you felt old earlier. So I'm like, yeah, you're right. not no, old, no. you're just wise. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, that's right. No, 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 we've all got a lot of range. No, we do. We do. What are the key lessons that you've learnt along your journey so far? Yeah, yeah. Always an interesting question, and, and as with leadership, we all have our personal journeys, and and we all go to leadership classes, and we get taught about how we've got to be, you know, all knowing and wise, and good business judgment, and great people, people, you know, etc. Yeah, look, some of the things I, I reflect on, maybe three or four of them, I'll just mention briefly. I mean, firstly, I think it's really important as a leader to make time to know yourself, know what drives you, what what you enjoy we all have strengths and areas that need a bit of development and just spending time to really understand that really makes you a better leader because then where you can lean in where you need other people to help you that's really important but i think the second thing is while you spend time you know knowing who you are you need to know what you stand for and what you want to achieve and knowing that is really important because when you bring that humanity and that sense of purpose to a role people realize it people see it and look i know it's it's we've been called many different things you know leadership or whatever transparency but it's more about being true to who you are and not trying to be something you're not mm. when i've seen leaders that are trying to be something or be a billionaire whatever they sort of lose integrity and i think that's a real issue mm. uh for people i think the third one is Learn how to make failure your friend. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying fail often. That's not what I'm saying is, but look, the more the issue of failure or not being as successful as something as you want to be, the real issue is how you respond to it. And I think great leaders, I mean, any leader, I mean, you go back to Bonaparte, to you know Churchill, to Florence Nightingale, whatever it is, they have failures along the way. And it's really their ability to respond to them and get up again and do it again and learn from that failure and as you were saying before you know the other thing is remember that you don't get so caught up in today that you don't see get perspective around where you're going i mean i think for most of us we'll probably be in some form of work until the 80s uh, retirement's a funny term i mean yes it means you're going from full-time work to something else that's fine but yeah i think your life goes in in different periods and you want to make the most of that and keep contributing back to the community, society, business, or whatever it, you enjoy. So that'd be the things that I've learned in my leadership. So, you know, know what you stand for, know where you want to get to, understand how you use failure to get better, and, you know, keep perspective in the career. I love that. I think it's quite insightful. And when you say them, you go, they all make sense. But yeah. sometimes we get lost in the business of we our do. lives in what we've got to achieve in the rat race, in managing children yep. as well as managing your personal and your professional life. And it's hard to take sometimes to take a step out. So one yeah. of the things I was thinking about when you were saying those four things, David, was around a mentor. And there's a fair bit of conversation mm. at the moment around mentorship. And this wasn't on my list of questions, but you know, do sense. you have a mentor and have you found during your leadership journey mentors valuable? Yeah. Well, I've always had people right through my career who I would talk to, and they weren't necessarily, in inverted yeah. commas, mentor, but I all, always made a point of having quite diverse people who didn't necessarily 
always agree with me or they yeah. had a different perspective on it. Because I think as you, you know, for all of us, we realize that and we do have these biases or these ways of looking at the world or situations that aren't necessarily helpful and getting other people's perspectives on an issue or what you're doing is really helpful because it just helps you understand, which is part of you know being a good listener. But I did actually, when I was CEO of Telstra, I had a formal mentor okay. and it was a person who you know, was quite different to me. I had different perspectives on it, challenged me sometimes would say, well, David, you know, what are you doing? Have you made a decision yet? Well, it ended up being quite a good friendship, but it was quite, in a way, it was someone who could confront the outside of the work environment or the family environment. So, yeah, I do think it's really important. I think we all need input into yeah. our careers and lives and sometimes just blow some steam off because you're, you're frustrated. So I think it's really important. Yeah. I've never really had a so formal mentor, but you're right. Yeah. Finding people who've got different perspectives, who can challenge mm. you, who don't think the same way as you, who you might not agree with everything they're going to say, but they're definitely oh. a different perspective. And you go, yeah. you know what, I hadn't thought about it like that. And maybe that is something I should take on board. But I really like those four lessons. Yeah, no, Joe, I, I think that's really important. And it tests your own assumptions. And being open mm. to different views is really important. Not that you become wishy-washy. It's about oh, yeah. honing your view and what you stand for and how you are going to go forward. Uh, but you've got to listen first. So that's why, you know, listening is always an important skill to have. It's very important. And I think yeah. it's something that's definitely on my list of things to focus on. And I think when you do really listen, yeah. um, rather than just thinking of the next thing you're going to say, but you actually genuinely really do listen, you can get a different view of the world, right? Yeah, yeah. No, really, so true, so true. So the next question is, what's something that you're really proud of or what's been a highlight for you in your career to date? Yeah, well, I think if I look at sort of an external metric, the thing that probably I'm, I'm most proud of being a part of was actually at Telstra when it was voted the most trusted company in Australia. Now, some some people listening to this may say, you know, why would that be it? When, when we started, I, I People may not know, but every year there's a trust index, the Edelman Trust Index, and they rate companies on trustworthiness. And I always felt for Telstra that it, people didn't trust it, didn't trust it to deliver, didn't trust it, what it said. And when I became CEO, I said, look, what we wanted to be is become the most trusted and respected company in Australia. We weren't even in the top 100 when we started and it said so much around the people in Telstra and how they turned up because they did so many good things but it wasn't always seen mm. and then when the wider community said look hey we trust Telstra I mean wasn't saying we were perfect wasn't saying that we got everything right but they knew that we would be there and we had integrity so that was you know probably a really proud moment mm. for me. It wasn't about financial performance or anything like that. It was, it was far deeper. And I suppose the other one, life is about people. And, you know, I've had the great pleasure of working with such great people. And we've had great teams. Sometimes it's hard working in a team, but we persevered. And then to see all that they achieved. And, mm. you know, you just can't get things done without real collaboration and great people around you so that's always been a really uh, a great highlight of my career and still hope still is hopefully <laughs> going forward <laughs> yeah. yeah it's hard right because as a ceo of a company at the size of telstra right having mm. a leadership team and the next level down and having people that really have the same vision of where telstra wanted to go and were aligned and then yeah. really aligning, but then kind of trusting and coaching and guiding people to make sure that they got the right outcome, right? Is, is part yeah. of being a CEO of such a large company. Yeah, yeah. I think you use that wonderful word alignment. It is easy to say really hard to do. And because we all interpret things, I mean, you can be in a room and Someone says, we've got to go and do X. And everyone sort of interprets it slightly differently. So you've really got to lean into that about uh, how you get a common understanding of what you want to achieve as a group. Uh, you've got to stare into where there may be some lack of clarity and work that through. And then 
inevitably you start down a certain course and it becomes hard. You might be customer service or a new product innovation, whatever, and you put it into the market and it doesn't work. And then you've got to go back and rework it. So it does take real honesty yeah. and real transparency to get alignment. And I, I can remember in all my roles I've had, it seems like every three to four months, there sort of needs to be a resetting, but you've got to come back and say, hey, are we really yeah. still aligned? Is there something else we need to change up here to keep that sense of purpose and being driven by something bigger than you all individually? So yeah, and it's hard work, hard work. Mm -hmm. It's not straightforward. And I think in some of the companies that we're working with at the moment, we're seeing that it's always been important, but I think more so now with this cold post-COVID period being really aligned of what's important, right? What's not so important, yeah. what's really important, we're going to hone in on. And, and yeah. where exec teams are really clear and they are aligned and they're running in the same direction, the outcome yeah. is so much better than, and don't get me wrong, no exec team is perfect, but yeah. continuing to get on the same page, having the difficult conversations, being able to air things together rather than behind each other's backs and yep. have really honest, frank conversations is kind of part of the process, right? So that's yeah, um, I couldn't agree more. And you and you do need to bring objectivity into the room. I mean, it's not to, you know, sometimes you've got to work out personal traits and how we're all working together, but the, you need something, a real metrics that about real achievement and hold yourself accountable for them and the group so that you can drive forward and make a difference because at the end of the day, we're there to jointly achieve something. Yeah. I always said that you know, great leadership is actually achieving something bigger than each individual could achieve themselves. So it's about how we work together to create something uh, that is greater than the, the individuals all working individually and that's what great leaders do somehow they inspire you allow you enable you to really contribute and then to achieve something that is we all probably start off thinking gee can we do it but then somehow you do and gee it's inspiring when it does happen yeah it's really good yeah. as you say people are kind of the heart of everything right you get the people yeah they are right yeah. you can get everything yeah. right yeah. So I'm interested, and maybe it's a bit more of a thing, but you know, you played obviously a key role in this whole customer culture piece that tells true. Yeah. You mentioned the trust piece, so I assume that all kind of links. But what drove this program of work, and 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 what what was I suppose one of the key highlights from your perspective? Yeah. So there's a couple of angles on this one. I mean, one is for for Telstra or any organisation. I mean, customer service is sort of in a way. So obvious. So you yeah. want to get good customers. Well, I give good customers and I feel better. Someone says, thank you. But actually it was driven by that. And my, I'd worked at IBM and customer centric had always been there. But there was this other side of me. Well, a couple of sides actually. One was I'd always been frustrated. I'd worked at big organizations and I'd, I'd studied through the work I'd done. Look, the big organization and wonder why is it that every five to six years, they sort of go through either the CEO changes, they change all the leadership team, or they have this, you know, burning platform for change. Another transformation comes along. And I said, I, I was always wondering, why is it that you have to go through these like cathartic experiences where everything needs to change and off you go? Why weren't we able to be in a state of continual improvement? And the great thing around customer centricity, and look, maybe there's other ways to do it, I don't know, but if you're truly driven by the customer and and the customer's voice comes into everything you do, from you know, product you design, the way you deliver it, the way you build them, the way you do receivables, everything you do, you, you're just continually being driven to improve. And customer centricity becomes this constant pursuit that you never quite arrive because customers are, they're always demanding. But if you get it really, then you start to drive innovation because you want to do it better. You drive efficiency because complexity and failure is the curse of any organization. So serving the customer, and by the way, I'm not saying customers are always right. No. You know, they're demanding and you've got to make judgment. But if you truly get the voice of the customer into everything you do, it's stops you becoming lethargic or 
thinking like you've arrived because then you've got this constant reinvention and you keep innovating and you keep moving forward. That's why I really liked it. And of course, it's cultural as well, because often in our organizations, especially big complex ones, they become very hierarchical and your de decisions often get delegated up rather than downward. And what you want to do is create an environment where people are empowered mm -hmm. to serve the customer. And it's amazing. And it comes back to this trust word. You trust people to do the right thing. 99% of the time, they will. It's so interesting in big organizations. Often all the rules and the sh thou shalt not are usually to try to control the 0.05% of bad behavior rather than celebrating the good behavior and moving forward. So that's why it was so important to me and to us at Telstra. And it really did move the culture of the organization. And not perfectly, we still failed, but we still had this deep, deep-seated drive to really delight the customer, create a, a unique experience. And it drove differentiation as well. Mm -hmm. So it isn't just a feeling. It isn't just a philosophy. It, it really is about driving deep improvement in organizations. So, yeah, that's what drove it to me. And we had a blast, really. It was great fun. Yeah, it's really interesting, right? I, I like the concept of kind of continuously improving. And if you put yeah. a customer at the center, how do you continuously think about how you're going to change things to make it yeah. work better for them and putting yourself in their shoes? I yeah. think large organizations and small, um, yeah. people get lost looking internally at what they're doing rather than looking at where the customer's at. And I think yeah. more important than ever, even though it's always been important, is the customer has changed over this COVID period. What the customer yeah. was and what they wanted and what they're looking for is now actually changed and probably exponentially so. And so one yeah. of the things that we're really challenging our um, clients to do is go back and go and talk to your customer, go and get yeah. the data points because actually yeah. what you might have wanted 18 months ago may have changed. But I like, yeah. I like yeah. that continuous improvement. It doesn't have to be a big bang transformation program, but how do you every day continuously improve the way you service your customers and how do you trust your employees who let's be honest are at the cold front of dealing with yeah. customers and no more than the yeah. senior executives sitting around the board table uh, absolutely what really needs to happen to change things right? yeah so, yeah joe i mean i really agree with everything you just said that is so important interesting you know a couple of other just sort of points i mean i can talk a lot around this particular subject but it's got to be driven by real customer data. It, you yes. see, the other thing is it, we put in a, we spent $50 million putting in a advocacy. We could tell you customer satisfaction by product, by process, by channel, by interaction. So it was very data driven and that was the voice of truth. So it wasn't just attitude. And I often say we treated the customer data as important as the financial data. Yeah. We think to the customer data. So we used to do quarterly reviews on on what the customer is saying around a certain product or a channel interaction, and we took action and got back to customers. So it was very, very real time. And then we would analyze things, and some things were really hard. We couldn't change them, but you've got to get deep into the system. And there's a lot of, as you said, process improvement, doing things differently, innovation. So yeah. all related. I really like that, the data piece, right? Not just having a chat, but getting no. the cold, hard facts and then understanding yeah. what that really means, understanding at the level of detail that you can actually drive an outcome. Yeah. I think one of the things when I was at Telstra is that MPS was part of the incentive plan. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And I am a bit of a believer that incentives do drive behaviour. So if you mm. incentivize people, it does actually make people look at things that maybe they hadn't looked at or they put it some more effort in or they put some more focus in. But what yeah. it does is it, regardless, it sends a signal to the organisation that this is important. And if we can't get this right, it doesn't really matter about anything else because this is actually critical. And ultimately, if you can improve your NPS, it will flow through your financial result, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, Joe, you put your, your finger right on the hot point. Mm. You see, a lot of people say, customer service is important mm. and it's one of the KPIs. You see, you've got to really test yourself to say, if we truly serve the customer better, it will deliver better financial results and create shareholder value. And 
we had a business model. So we said if customers were happier, they would churn yeah. less, they'd buy more product and lifetime value improve. And it did. But yeah. it was a big leap. And to your second point around incentives, you can't say the customer is the most important thing. Then, then measure people on financial outcomes. You've got to say, hey, we're putting our money where our mouth is and we're going for it. And I can still remember having a discussion with the board. I said, okay, David, well, we go. Remember at the same time at Telstra, and, and we were taking a billion dollars of cost out of you. We had a $15 billion. But as you drove a better customer experience, failure reduced, and therefore we had, could stop doing work that was unproductive and unnecessary. It's amazing. And costs just started to drop away. And it wasn't us reducing the budget. It was actually happening in the organization. So yeah, look, I think there's a lot of real deep consequences of really thinking this through that I think, it, and it makes a happier organization yeah. too. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. So. No, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Not many companies put, no. put it where their mouth is. They, they're not no. really actually stick up to say that's what they're going to be able to measure. Yeah. I think it all links, but I'm quite a big believer in employee engagement. I think if you get, yeah. maybe I don't agree with all of the way the surveys are done, but if you genuinely get your employee engagement right, it will also help drive your customer piece, but it'll also help yeah. drive your financial piece. And I yeah. have actually, because I'm a dork, done some kind of statistical analysis around that because I think there's a That's really major important. piece that people yeah. miss. They go, oh, yeah, I'm worried. I'm, I'm interested in that employee engagement score. I'm more interested in how the employees actually actively engaged in helping yeah. you your organisation. And if yeah. they are and you've got the right people, then it will drive a big outcome. So, yeah, so really yeah, Joe, yeah. Engagement's important and employee advocacy for your organization. Yeah. How can you have, you know, well, in Telsa's case, it was 60,000 people with only 10,000 saying, I'm really proud to work here. You've got to, <laughs> you know, you've got to have that, that your biggest advocate. I mean, and they, you know, how they talk to their family, their friends, and that's stronger than, you know, spending millions of dollars of doing ads and, you know, talking about pretty things around your brand. It's actually the people. And their belief in what you're doing is so powerful. And that's engagement, isn't it? It you is know? engagement. And yeah. I just, I think that a lot of companies miss taking people on that journey, right? Like yeah. the, the execs around the board table might understand where they're heading and the board understand where they're heading. But the guy who's every day dealing with the customer is in the call center or, or really at yeah. the baseline, they genuinely care about the customer, but they don't understand how they fit into the ecosystem. Right? Yeah, uh, yeah that's, that's right. And so you've got to communicate. You got to, and look, at, and, it, and of course, other people say, oh, well, David, that's fine. You've got to steer yeah. into that. And, but if you tell people why yeah. and engage them, in, of course, they're not happy, but at least say, okay, I get it, move on. And, and you treat them with respect through the process. People say, okay, well, I've got to move on. So you can restructure and take cost out, deliver a better product, delight customers, and have a truly engaged workforce and, and transition the company because as the customers need change, to your point mm -hmm. around COVID, you've got to rebalance it. A product yeah. you had before may not be right. You've got to move it. You've got to invest something. That's just life. It's like children. I mean, they go through different yeah. stages and you change. So I think people understand that far more than we give them credit. Yeah. And and we got to engage them in the journey, as you were saying before. Yeah. Absolutely. It's yeah. a transparency piece, right? I think. It is too, yeah. 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 Generally, mm. employees know that something is changing and they'd prefer to hear about it on the grapevine. So it's just right. a communication. Yeah, absolutely. Transparency piece. So yeah. last couple of questions for you. If What yeah. do you wish someone had told you 20 years ago, not trying to make you feel <laughs> old, about oh, okay. being a leader? Yeah. Yeah. What was it be? Well, look, I think, I think I'd probably say be present. Yeah. Um, be in the moment. It's so easy when you've got a lot of things going on as a leader, you know, to get distracted and it's really important. You force yourself to be present in the moment and get the most out of it. I think the second thing I'd say is remember to make time for yourself. You need yeah. to, as I used to put, you know, schedule time for yeah. myself and to think. Now, because you just, to be, to be able to turn up and make a difference, you need to invest enough time in yourself. And look, uh, I think for all of us, especially in these sort of big jobs, it's partly look after your health as well, because 
but you want to be around into the 80s and 90s and doing whatever you want to do. And I think it's really important you have that longer term view. So that would be what I'd say. I like that. I think being present in the moment is so powerful. And when you have back-to-back meetings and you've got so many demands, it's really actually very hard. Yeah, it is really hard. You've actually got to actually tell yourself at the start of every meeting, do you know what, I've got an hour with this person, I've got half an hour and actually... Because then this is probably the most important meeting of the day and I need to actually be present. I need to listen. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I think and you said it earlier around some of your feedback around lessons that you've learned, but knowing yourself, understanding yourself, giving yourself mm. space, thinking about yourself, right? And I think that mm. you start off in your career, it's very easy. And I definitely did it, getting the rat race of getting yep. to the next level, getting to the next job, getting to the, where you want yep. to move getting enough money so that you can pay your mortgage and do what you you want to give your kids and all of that. Yeah. But actually taking a, taking a breath at some point and say, why am I doing this? Right. And how do I look after myself during the journey? So I'm here for the long haul, but also how do I give myself some different perspective and things? I think it's a really important one. So thinking time, not having back-to-back meetings, I yeah. do my best thinking on the weekend, but what that probably shows you is I'm not putting enough time during the week to actually. Ah, that's right, Joe. That's right. You need to <laughs> schedule some more time to yourself. Then. Yeah, but it is hard, isn't it? Because you've got, you know, all those things, you've got the pressure of the kids yeah. and getting stuff done and getting the shopping done, whatever it is, and of running a business. So you've got all these pressures of clients, but you've got to so that you then, you're making more of a difference when you're really in those moments. Yeah. But it's hard. So, I mean, they sound sort of obvious, but actually, even now, as I'm, you know, in a slightly different stage of my career, I, I continue to remind myself, I've got to make time. By the way, there's that really cool, I, I use the Office 365, how it analyzes your diary and says oh, you're not yeah. busy enough, focused enough. I think it's really good. Well, I go, oh, gee, I need to get more time here. So, it's actually but, good, but I normally go, oh my goodness, that's not me. <laughs> that's not the answer I wanted. But yeah, I, but I think these things are, really important if you're going to really be a good leader and turn up with people be effective yeah that's really interesting last question for you yeah. if you're not working what are you doing what gives you energy or a smile on your face yeah yeah well i mean lots of things actually i mean i i love life i love i love enjoy people obviously family are really yeah. important to me but i look i do exercise every morning that for yeah. me that's really important and you know, so I go off for swimming. I enjoy walking in the mountains, and so I make time for that as well. And I do enjoy some of the creative arts, more around woodwork and things like that. So I, I try to make time. Sometimes it goes up and down. I'm not doing much. But, but yeah, those things are really important to me. And being involved in things I enjoy and mm-hmm. seeing things change. So, yeah, that's me. Well, this has been so inspiring and so fantastic to hear from you about your journey to date i mean there's lots of takeaways from me but i think a couple would be knowing yourself understanding yourself what do you enjoy and what do you want to achieve to bring that authentic leadership right yeah while it's a buzz phrase it's like don't be someone else be yourself and bring yourself to work and and people will respect you and lean in with you more if you do that i I think that is, is really great yeah. I think that whole trusted company piece, and, and I didn't actually realise that journey with Telstra was really interesting, but that whole conversation we had around the customer culture and how you can just make continuous incremental changes and the fact that mm. employees actually know what to do, they just need to be empowered and they need to be yeah. supported, right? And I yeah. think I had a really great conversation about that customer piece, but also the employee engagement, right? And the importance of the people, right? When you've got 60,000 yeah. people that you're managing in an organisation, you can't do anything without that piece. And I no, think absolutely. the other piece that I think is coming up a lot in the clients that we're serving is this alignment piece of the executive, yeah. and getting that right and being really clear on what you're aligned on, what your priorities are, what you're focused yeah. on, and quarterly check-ins to your point around data yeah. around tricks and information that says yes we're on track no we're not on track but it's okay if we're not what are we going to do yeah. about it? what's the action that we're going to take right yeah so we're all in this new world that we're navigating we're getting back to the new normal which will never be normal it's a way for us to navigate our staff our companies and and us our personal lives as well so 
just mm. hearing some of the things that you've learned along your journey to date and some of just the key kind of takeaways are absolutely fantastic and i've loved the opportunity to chat with you today and thank you so much david for your time my pleasure joe and i wish you all the best and uh, everything you're doing so take care thank you